Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you for joining us today for our session on creative KMB practices. We're coming to you from Memorial University in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. I'm Andy Rousel, and I'm thrilled to welcome you all to today's event. Today's session will be recorded, and you can watch it later today on the Harris Center's website and YouTube channel. Uh, before we begin, I want to acknowledge that the lands on which Memorial University's campuses are situated are in the traditional territories of diverse indigenous groups. And we acknowledge with respect the histories and cultures of the Beothic, the Mi'kmaq, the Innu, and the Inuit of this province. We encourage everyone to reflect on these lands and those where you are located today, and to consider the indigenous peoples for whom these lands are traditional territory. Uh, for those who are new to the term knowledge mobilization, or KMB, uh, it's an umbrella term that includes any activities related to the production and use of research results. So it's the dissemination, the transfer, the exchange, and the co-creation of information by researchers and any knowledge users. Uh, some common ways of mobilizing knowledge, of mobilizing knowledge are writing an academic journal uh, or presenting at a conference. However, we're here today to go beyond the common. We're going to think outside of the box. Uh, there are many creative ways that knowledge can be shared, ways that allow for broader audiences and more extended reach. Today, we'll be looking at just a few of these opportunities and methods. We'd like to thank one of our sponsors for the series, the Future Skills Center. The center is a federally funded initiative that is committed to having all Canadians, from employees to employers, uh, understand and access what skills will be needed in the future labor market. And one skill that has been identified through the work is, in fact, knowledge mobilization, which is why we're all here today. Our presenter for today is Boyan Fierst, the KMB manager at the Harris Center at Memorial University. He is responsible for regional development programming, such as the Thriving Regions Partnership Process, which connects relevant research from the university to rural communities of Newfoundland. He also recently collaborated on a KMB course with York University and the University of Winnipeg. In addition to his now 10 years working at the Hare Center, Boyan is a photographer and the co-creator and co-host of Rural Roots, Canada's most prominent English language podcast dealing with rural issues. And he is also in his heart still a journalist. So we'll follow Boyan's presentation today with a 20 minute Q&A, uh, around 20 minutes, we'll see how much time we have. Uh, and, but we'll also check in a couple of times throughout the presentation for questions. So do please feel free to send us your questions at any time using the Q&A function or the chat box. And with that, we will pass the reins over to Boyan. Oh, thank you, Mandy. And uh, yes, she's right at the heart. I'm still a journalist. Um, it's kind of an affliction, lifelong affliction. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Brian Fierst, and I'm just going to share my screen here before I tell you a little bit more about me uh, so we can get started with this presentation. Okay. All right, you should all be seeing uh, my presentation. Oops, my presentation now. There we go. Uh, so, as Mandy said, I'm manager of knowledge mobilization here at the Leslie Harris Center of Regional Policy and Development at Memorial University of Newfoundland. And I'm very glad to be here today and to have a chance to talk to you about something I'm very passionate about. Uh, because I think that knowledge mobilization as a practice has a huge potential to help us face and solve some of the greatest challenges we face today. Uh, I do believe that in order to fulfill that potential of knowledge mobilization, we need to reach for every creative tool available to us to turn knowledge exchange into more memorable and better stories. And this is what this presentation is going to be about. Uh, so we are going to look at knowledge mobilization as a term because it does come from the academia. It has um, uh, it, it has uh, many definitions, and once I remember there was even a conference called K Star because people couldn't uh, agree to what to call it. Uh, so we are going to look at some of those definitions. We are going to look at the importance of audience, and then we are going to look at how the practice of knowledge mobilization may be relevant to your work, even if you are not 
at a university or an educational institution. And why I think that understanding knowledge mobilization is highly transferable skill, no matter what your career path is. So we are going to look at some creative approaches to knowledge mobilization, and then I'm going to share some example, or some samples of knowledge mobilization projects that use creative or arts-based approaches. Uh, and I hope that we might even in the audience have some of the people who use these. So let's get to it. As I said, there is no single definition of knowledge mobilization out there. And much of my daily work is about bridging the world of the institutional research carried out in a university and the world of rural and often remote communities whose knowledge does not appear on the pages of academic journals, but it becomes just as deep and just as important, in fact, more important, uh, given the context that uh, we often work in. So that is especially true when it comes to knowledge systems within Canada's First Nations, Inuit, Métis, and other Indigenous peoples. So as a knowledge mobilization practitioner, you need to adhere to some basic principles of open-mindedness. So let's go through some of those. Um, they're not really hard principles to work by, and uh, what they mostly focus on is this recognition that all knowledge is valuable and that knowledge mobilization as a practice needs to have a purpose. Uh, the most succinct definition of knowledge mobilization I know of comes from my colleague, Dr. David Phibbs at uh, York University, who said that knowledge mobilization is about making research useful to society. And that's certainly true in university context, but because of the context I work in, I like to swap the word research for the word knowledge. And that's because the context I work in involves the world outside of the university as much as the world inside. And that world outside, as I said, is often rural, often remote. And working on the periphery is not only a logistical problem you have to solve, although it is actually a logistical problem you often have to solve, but it also forces you to acknowledge that the context of the lives of people around you is in some crucial ways different than yours. And so you better pay attention to the knowledge and the stories they bring to the table. And that gets us to that third and fourth, those third, the, the third and fourth principle. Knowledge mobilization is always about exchange, right? So the process in order to work requires that exchange. The end product may seem like it's coming from one source, um, a researcher made brochure or a power presentation like this one. But the process that led to it in order to be a knowledge mobilization process has to be about give and take, about exchange. In order for that exchange to happen, we have to acknowledge, and often we need to explicitly say this, that all knowledge, institutional knowledge produced in universities, hospitals, research facilities, government, and the knowledge embodied in practice and lived experience. So all knowledge is valuable and it's worth sharing. So those principles are behind the definition of knowledge mobilization that we came up here uh, with uh, here at the Harris Center. And we call it a working definition because we are always very happy to change it if we think that we can add something or change something that would make it more comprehensive and better. Uh, so that definition says that knowledge mobilization is a process of harnessing all available knowledge into active service to benefit society. Both research knowledge and, and experiential knowledge are worth sharing for the benefit of all. Knowledge mobilization is always about knowledge exchange and it should be mutually beneficial. So this process usually, it's not, not always, but and not necessarily certainly, but usually results in some sort of a final product designed to share the final common knowledge that can be used by those who participated in the process, but also by those who may find themselves in similar circumstances and are looking to figure out how somebody else has dealt with similar problems in similar circumstances. So let's talk about the audience. So for a decade or so, um, in, in the past decade or so, academic and granting institutions, and that's really important, the granting institutions, have normalized and adopted knowledge mobilization as a part of the research process 
And that's great. Unfortunately, within the universities, more often than not, we treat knowledge mobilization as just another box to check on a tri-council application. And you can always tell when we do it too, because, uh, and when we don't take it seriously, because we don't ask and answer some basic questions about the knowledge mobilization plan um, that we are proposing. And instead, we focus on the outputs and tools we are going to produce. So in the proposal, we don't focus on process, but we focus on the website or on the podcast or on a film or whatever we are going to, what we imagine will be the final knowledge mobilization tool we are going to use. Uh, what we don't do is actually determine who is our audience and determining who our audience is, who is that we want to talk to and who is that we want to hear from and in what way we will be able to use the knowledge we create together is actually what should dictate the approaches and the end products we produce. So the thing about knowledge mobilization is that it is not something that lives only in academia. Obviously, all sorts of organizations, enterprises, and communities use these different kinds of approaches to knowledge exchange in improving what they do. So understanding principles and approaches to knowledge mobilization is this ultimate transferable skill, no matter what you do. So let's talk about the knowledge mobilization as a process. I'm going to talk about it in the context of research, but every time I say research, you can substitute that with project, and I'm pretty sure it's going to work. So knowledge mobilization can occur at any point during a research project. There is really no way, no right way to do it. But there is usually an appropriate way to do it, given the context you're working in. So there are projects that lend themselves really nicely to a continuous knowledge mobilization process built right into the research or project design right from the beginning. And if your project could um, benefit from that, um, by all means, do it. Remember that knowledge mobilization is something you do because it serves a purpose, not because it's a nice thing to do. On some projects, knowledge mobilization process may be something you can say for the very end of your project. And then you are going to have this really deep, rich conversations around your findings with people who will have insights to contribute and the ability to use the information you share to solve whatever issue they may be facing. Remember again, you need to talk to the right people at the right moment with purpose and openness. Uh, so the standard knowledge mobilization toolkit is always expanding. There is always the new thing that everybody's trying to do. And we are all familiar with sort of the standard kit, the presentations, round tables, there's a range of different publications and specifically designed websites around the projects. Knowledge mobilization, and, and I think this is something we don't always remember, is really about storytelling. And so it's not a surprise that there is an increasing number of projects that employ some form of art-based or creative approach to that base, basic purpose of telling a good story about something you learned. So whatever tool you, tool you decide to pick from your knowledge mobilization toolkit, you always have to remember that it does need to speak to your audience and it does need to meet a goal or a need you identified ahead of time. So I'm going to pause here for a second. If there are any questions so far, I can answer one or two. If not, I'm happy to actually move to that creative and arts-based knowledge mobilization approaches. Mandy, do we have any questions? I don't think we have any at the end. Perfect. Okay. I'll just keep going, going. and uh, we can save the uh, conversation for the end. Absolutely. So let's talk about creative and arts-based approaches to knowledge mobilization. Everything I just said 
the purpose behind a knowledge mobilization uh, plan, knowledge mobilization as a mutually beneficial knowledge exchange, the importance of an audience and the right approach to that audience. All of that is still going to hold with whatever approach to knowledge mobilization you take. If you have the ability and resources to bring creative and artistic practice into your knowledge mobilization toolkit, that can be wonderful, but it's not always necessary. And there are two things you need to be aware of. The first one is that you and your team, what you are creating is not necessarily a piece of art or a documentary film or a creative podcast or an impressive performance or whatever. What it needs to be first and foremost is a piece of effective knowledge mobilization, not a vehicle for your self-expression. So you have a job to do, you have a purpose and an audience, and that's what you're trying to do using the skills and tools that you would use in your artistic or creative practice. But you will always keep the purpose and the audience behind what you're doing in mind. So that, 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 that matters. Another thing you should keep in mind is that if you choose to employ creative and artistic approaches to knowledge mobilization, your audience will judge you based not just on the information you are conveying, but also on the production value of your final knowledge mobilization package. Your audience will have expectations around what a podcast should sound like, what a documentary film should look like and how a piece of visual art, for example, should feel on a wall. There's no way around that. So I cannot stress enough that creative and arts-based approaches to knowledge mobilization can be very resource intensive. Like you have to be prepared for that. Depending on what you're trying to accomplish, you may need lights, cameras, microphones, stage, um, all sorts of materials, uh, access to studios, um, galleries, performance spaces. You may need specialized software, specialized hardware. But most of all, and we are so guilty of forget, forgetting this in academia or downloading this responsibility to students, most of all, you're going to need humans who know what they're doing. These are skills that are often learned through practice, not necessarily in a classroom. And people who are very good at it have spent a very long time doing it. So you need to work with those people. And all of that is going to require financial resources, time, project management skills. So before you embark on a creative knowledge mobilization adventure, make sure you have the backing of your institution and that your team understands that this will not be quite as easy to pull off as a panel discussion in the library lunchroom or a Zoom, Zoom webinar like the one that we are right now sitting at. So if you have a plan, you have a support and resources for a creative or arts-based knowledge mobilization project, why would you do it? But aside from the fact that it actually often works amazingly well, um, there are other reasons. A well-executed knowledge mobilization plan can often help you reach a much larger audience. Uh, it, this could be national or even an international audience in scope. Interestingly, and we'll see this with some of the examples, a creative knowledge mobilization tool can easily get a life of its own and you may find people are using something you made in environments and in ways that you have not originally intended for that thing to be used. And you have to be okay with that. That means that something you created as a knowledge mobilization tool for a community may find its way into a classroom or into a government and corporate board. Many of these projects, because of their production value and quality, often also have a long shelf life. So you may find that a short film you made five years ago is still the go-to piece of information on that particular topic. Also, uh, a well-executed piece of creative knowledge mobilization material 
can leave a lasting impression. And there's some really interesting psychological reasons why that happens. So your audience is not likely to remember a conference presentation, but they may remember an impressive visualization, a short film, or a particularly impactful podcast episode. So the reason why they tend to remember these things better is because these kinds of tools tend to engage their emotions as well as their minds. So another aspect, and so that's another aspect to sort of keep in mind. One more thing that we don't often talk about, but I actually think it's quite important, is that if you employ these kinds of knowledge mobilization tools that are creative and the whole process is fun and it allows an entire team of researchers, makers, knowledge holders, knowledge mobilization professionals to work together collaboratively and build an interesting package, but also a strong team, you now have a group of people who have accomplished something and who down the road may be able to tackle an even more complex problem. And I think that's really important and something that we really need to start paying attention to in, in our organizations. So let's look at some examples of creative and arts-based approaches to knowledge mobilization. So I want to say uh, most of these examples are going to be from Newfoundland and Labrador, and most of them are right here at Memorial University. Don't be put <laughs> off by that. Uh, I could have used examples from across the country. I reached for the ones that I'm very familiar with. You should think about these not as individual projects, but as examples of types of kinds of things that you can do if you have the right team available. So the, the project I first want to highlight is really a remarkable piece of work uh, by Dr. Pam Hall. Uh, it's called Towards an Encyclopedia of Local Knowledge and it's an arts-based research and knowledge mobilization project. Uh, what Pam did is work very closely with local knowledge holders in rural Newfoundland and Labrador, and she used her artistic skills to create really an immensely compelling set of encyclopedic entries, focusing on the knowledge that exists in our communities. But while she was doing that, she also brought her own expertise and research abilities to bear on all of that co collected information. So this is a, one of those examples where knowledge mobilization process is almost indistinguishable from the research process itself. So I'll show you a couple of more plates. Um, the encyclopedia has three chapters. The first chapter um, was created in collaboration with the people in the Great Northern Peninsula and Bombay. Uh, so she has illustrated, Pam has illustrated, photographed, and designed every single entry, grounding it in the local knowledge and her own artistic sensibilities. So I'll show you a couple more uh, examples from that chapter. So the second chapter was produced in collaboration with the people of Change Islands and Fog Island. So these are two small islands in the Notre Dame Bay, for those of you not from Newfoundland. Um, that's just northeast of the mainland uh, Newfoundland, main island of Newfoundland. Uh, some of you may have heard of Fog Island because of its world-renowned inn. Um, Change Islands is a tiny community of some 250 people, um, and it's right next to Summer Plunger, Fog Island. So I'll show you a couple more plates. These first two chapters were published as a coffee table book by Breakwater and Iser Books here at Memorial. And the communities received, I believe, a set of prints. There was a touring exhibit. And there are books that are given to local libraries and other institutions. The third chapter is also complete. Uh, and uh, it was completed in partnership with Miupukek First Nation and a local indigenous artist, Jerry Evans. And I think really here, Pam's dedication and respect for local knowledge and the local knowledge keepers really kind of becomes obvious here. So she didn't build just one panel for each of these uh, knowledge items. She built two. 
And the way she did that is that the first panel is in English, and then the second panel is in uh, Mi'kmaqisik. Now, I'll show you a couple more plates. What's really interesting here is that the, these panels are not translations from English into Mi'kmaq language or the other way around. They're kind of translated as they needed to be translated between the, the languages and the knowledge keepers, right? So a couple more plates here. The second project I want to show you actually doesn't come from Memorial University or even from a university. It comes from the city of Edmonton. Uh, I recently completed a documentary about a radio documentary about urban forests and came around um, across this wonderful example. The city of Edmonton some time ago used an open source mapping software and um, worked with the citizens um, to help map every tree on the city's property. And it's really a remarkable piece of work. Uh, you can dive right down to individual trees that will tell you the species, the size, the age, whole bunch of information. Uh, and it's really valuable information, but it also helped the city develop this really interesting collaboration with many of its citizens around something that everybody cares about, our uh, trees in our cities. It's really like if you have a chance, um, Google it. It's really quite spectacular. Uh, another project that we funded here at the Harris Center um, that also used a mapping technology is the work of Dr. Patrick Gagnon from the Ocean Science Center. Um, he uh, worked with communities on Bayward Peninsula to help them develop a potential sea urchin aquaculture resource. And what he did, he used um, ArcGIS story mapping application. So it's a proprietary application. It's available to researchers at most universities. Um, and one of the modules or applications that comes with this whole package is the story map application, which allows um, the creator to make a map that is highly interactive. You can have photographs, videos, stories, links. Um, it's really interesting um, piece of software, actually. Um, Patrick used the uh, ArcGIS story mapping application to give us the sense of the tools, um, of the community assets, uh, of the research uh, instruments, uh, as well as actually show us things that we wouldn't be able to see normally, such as the sea urchins um, in the areas where they live um, on the seaboard. Um, this was presented to the community and they really had really fascinating conversations in the workshop um, that we organized once this uh, was made public. Uh, another uh, example I would like to share is Dr. Paul De Decker, and he may or may not be with us today. Um, Paul, and this is again a project that the Harris Center funded on the southwest coast of uh, Newfoundland. Uh, and Paul made a short documentary film uh, called Lights, Camera, Grow uh, about uh, food security issues. Um, in that part of the province, but also about how some of the community members are starting to address some of those issues. He's a linguist and a filmmaker, and he worked with a crew in order to produce a 16-minute documentary, uh, and that crew in, uh, included a um, cameraman, a sound engineer, um, editors, um, drone pilot who took some um, aerial shots, um, so with that kind of excellent production quality, tight editing, interesting storyline, the film is not only a piece of knowledge mobilization tool for the community, but it's now uh, part of different short documentary festivals as well. So that reflects really well, obviously, Patrick and his research team, but it's also um, something we are very proud of as one of the founders. Uh, sometimes you are forced to reach into your creative toolbox because the circumstances force you to do so. So just before the pandemic, we started working with a research team at our Grandfell campus uh, and with Newfoundland and Labrador Forest Association on a project around bioeconomy opportunities and the lumber industry in the province. 
normally this would be um, a very simple thing for us to do. We do this all the time. Uh, the idea was that uh, we would bring um, regional stakeholders, community residents uh, for a tour of uh, the mill. There is four such mills around the province. Um, they would take a look at the kinds of um, assets uh, the mill has available, the kind of residue, the kind of um, additional ways that they could use some of the um, some of the excess energy they have, for example. And then we would have a half a day or a day long workshop where they would put community assets and lumber mill assets together and come up with some ideas for the projects. Unfortunately, just before we were able to do that, COVID-19 pandemic hit and we were not able to bring people together, certainly not for a tour of a industrial facility. And we could also not bring a full crew together to make um, a film. So uh, as Mandy mentioned at the beginning, I maintain photographic and radio documentary practice still outside of my work. Um, so I made, I went alone uh, on the tour of each of these facilities. I made a whole bunch of uh, photographs uh, in, uh, in all of these um, facilities and I recorded interviews and we created something um, that is known as a photoroman in the <laughs> photographic world. Uh, it feels like a film, but really it's an audio slideshow. Um, so with all of these um, movies made, and they were all about 14 to 15 minutes, we used an online uh, engagement tool where we were able to post um, these videos. We were able to invite um, community residents and community stakeholders and the mill owners to watch the video, reflect on what they've seen. And then we organized a whole bunch of online conversations in order to move um, the project forward and to help residents think about potential um, uses of uh, the assets that mill brings to the table. So because we had an option for me to work alone and without a film crew, we were able to do that despite COVID. Another thing that we do here at the Harris Center, uh, my colleague Kathy Newhook produces every year Vital Signs. It's a uh, publication that exists in many parts uh, of the country. Uh, it's always created in partnership with a local community foundation. And we do ours in partnership with uh, Community Foundation of Newfoundland and Labrador. And it's really a tool that uses infra infographics and layered information focused on things people care about. Um, but it does so in order to communicate very complex data. We add well-written stories to it and we create this really rich publication. So it always starts with this infographic of what would Newfoundland look like if it were a village of 100. And this allows us to overlay a whole bunch of um, information. Sometimes it's health information, sometimes it's population information, demographic information, sometimes it has to do with environment, employment. Um, but it's much easier to visualize what the province looks like if you think of it as a village of 100 than, you know, a giant geography with over half a million people. Um, this year, we also added complexity to this publication. Um, and we did that through creating this really complex graphic that overlays some key economic indicators uh, over a historic timeline that allows us to see how the province changed in some ways um, since um, 1949 when uh, Newfoundland and Labrador became part of the Canadian uh, Confederation. Um, here at the Harris Center, we also have been running a podcast on rural issues. Uh, it started as a proof of concept, but it eventually became a podcast with over 40 episodes, 25,000 downloads. And this is a really interesting example how the production values for the first season were actually quite low. But the content was something that community and campus radio stations and rural researchers in Canada could not find anywhere else. So despite the fact that they 
um, production value was not as good as it could have been. We still managed to place this podcast on uh, community and campus radio stations across the country, uh, and it found its ways uh, into the classrooms and the boardrooms. It's important to remember that good content will trump poor production values in most cases, but it only buys you a grace period. Eventually, you need to get better at what you're doing. So we worked really hard, we did get better, and today, Rural Roots is not only a podcast, but the episodes are used in rural development classes right across the country, as well as in classes in Italy and in some of the schools in the United States and in Scotland. We have listeners who come from across 50 different countries, and it has really been not just a fun project to do, um, but it really proved that um, if you invest time and energy into knowledge mobilization process, you can create something that has immense value to a really large number of people. So some parting thoughts. Um, notice that we really just scratched the surface here. There is really no limit to what kind of creative and arts-based tools and approaches you can bring to your knowledge mobilization practice. We did not talk about the use of theater. We did not talk about creative publications, creative use of social media. We did not talk about music at all, for example. As you experiment with your ever-growing toolbox that's at your disposal, it's always good to remember the basics. Knowledge mobilization always has a purpose and it always involves a knowledge exchange. Respecting and drawing on all sources of knowledge is really important. How you do that is up to you, but never lose sight of your audience and your purpose. Those are the things that are the bedrock. This is what you're going to build everything you're doing on. Approaching knowledge mobilization with sort of creative flair and using creative and arts-based tools um, can be really effective, and it's definitely a fun thing to do. Do remember to make sure you have the resources and the buy-in from your audience, the organization you work for, and your partners before you embark on a creative, complex, and potentially resource-intensive project. All of this sounds very serious, but ultimately, knowledge mobilization practice should be fun. I really firmly believe that. Knowledge mobilization is about people and fostering good, productive relationships. So go out there, make something, learn something, help somebody else learn something. And then the key component is that of that is to come back and tell the rest of us how you did it so that we can learn how to be better at it. So I'm going to stop here. I'm going to leave this slide on for like 10 seconds. You can write down my email um, and you can find me on Twitter and Instagram if um, that's something uh, you want. Uh, and I'm happy to turn this over to Mandy for any questions we may have. All right. Okay. So we do have one question here right now, Boyan. I'm just going to bring it up. Okay. Uh, so uh, this person asks, planning for this kind of KMB from the outset seems like the best approach, but with limited funding available and every expenditure needing justification, how do you build a convincing budget for these kinds of activities? Uh, so um, the bad news is that it's hard. The good news is that uh, if, especially if you are within the university, if you read the descriptions of many of the funds that exist through Tri-Council and here at uh, Memorial University, we are really lucky to have Office of Public Engagement as well as um, the Harris Center where asking for knowledge mobilization funding is not a strange thing. Um, but things like connection grants, um, which is part of the SHRC portfolio of grants, um, we tend to use them within the academic community for conferences. Uh, we actually received connection grant for Rural Roots. 
And the argument we made was that what we are creating is a knowledge mobilization meta tool, which can be used in multiple locations, in multiple contexts for multiple purposes, and that it is no different than having than funding a conference. The difference is that instead of bringing a whole bunch of people to hear a group of speakers, we are bringing a whole bunch of speakers to a much broader audience that may or may not be able to um, attend the conference. So I think the best way to obtain some of this funding is to work right now within the existing systems um, and to find creative ways to use the funding that's available. Uh, also, I know of researchers at this university and at some other universities who have uh, completed their research, but for their knowledge mobilization, because they, they bring certain artistic practice to what they do, they were able to obtain uh, provincial and federal uh, arts grants um, to complete knowledge mobilization projects. Um, the, most of the provinces have uh, arts councils. And of course, there is kind of a Council for the Arts, which also has um, many, many, many funding programs. Again, this works if you have an established um, artistic practice. If you don't, um, that funding may be hard to access. Then again, and then again, there is um, there is funding available through places like um, Office of Public Engagement here, which has funds specifically designed to support. Um, different forms of public engagement. Um, also, there are many foundations out there, um, philanthropic foundations, that support research dissemination, community development, community engagement, who are uh, willing to fund um, all sorts of interest in knowledge mobilization projects. All right, thanks a lot, Boyan. Okay. Do have one more question here now. Let me read it out for you. Uh, so is there a difference in how you track and measure impact of creative types of Canby and what we call standard Canby? That is really hard because quite frankly, we don't really have good measures for standard KMB, never mind the creative approaches to it. Um, I am a big, I, we here at the Harris Center, we keep track of the number of participants we have, the number of people who watch the live stream, whatever, all of that matters. Um, and we do the same for, I can obviously tell you how many people listen to our podcast and all of that kind of stuff. So you can keep track of all of those things. Obviously with the podcast, we know that it would be really difficult for us to bring 40 speakers um, to one place and have a conference that would have 25,000 people. That would simply not happen. Um, so we know that that was a very effective way of disseminating stories. I'm really a huge proponent of qualitative um, evaluations. Uh, I think you need to go out and talk with people and, and ask very pointed questions. Ask them, what do they remember? What did they learn? Did they... Um, access that kind of um, knowledge mobilization um, tools that you made available. Um, it is difficult to measure these things, but we do know that um, they are effective. And you can see that we have been very diligent in capturing conversations on social media, for example, around particular um, rural roots episodes. Um, so you can do it, but it does require dedication and it's, um, it's tricky. There are no really good measures of how you do that, especially since um, some of those impacts can happen a year or two years down the road, or they may happen. Somebody may have heard, may have watched um, Dr. De Decker's movie and learn something important and started a project in their community because of that movie. But we are never going to know that unless they tell us. Hi, Lisa. Uh, all right, Boyan, we've actually got someone here who'd uh, like to ask uh, you their question themselves. So we're going to give Lisa the chance now to speak. Hi, Lisa, nice to hear from you. Hi, Boyan, really good session. Thank you so much. Um, you were talking earlier about how sometimes researchers, you know, approach the knowledge mobilization as a check mark 
in a very lengthy uh, application. Do you find that more and more uh, faculty are approaching your team to sit with you to consult on a knowledge mobilization plan uh, specifically designed for their project? Is that something that you do often? It, that always happened. Um, what I do, I, I don't think that the frequency of, the, of these requests has grown, but I do know for sure, because I see it everywhere, is that faculty and researchers across the university are taking this really seriously. I think there is a whole bunch of reasons for that, um, partially because we are recognizing that knowledge exists we are much more readily recognizing that knowledge, all sorts of knowledge exists outside of the university and researchers are curious bunch. So this kind of knowledge mobilization uh, really comes naturally to them. So I, can, I see that the practice of engaging, of exchanging knowledge is there a lot more. Um, I still see knowledge mobilization plans that don't always think very specifically about the audience. And I would like researchers to think about their audience and the purpose of what they want to communicate a little bit more and a little bit less uh, about the ways they're going to do that, the actual things they're going to make. Um, I don't blame them for doing that because quite frankly, that gets scored on the outputs they're promising, but they don't necessarily get scored on the impacts and the audience they are hoping to reach. So I think it's a little bit of chicken and egg that we need to get better at recognizing the um, impacts and the value of knowledge mobilization before we see researchers maybe investing a little bit more time into the knowledge mobilization uh, process. I was recently talking to a bunch of researchers who were applying for a very large grant and I asked them, how much did you budget for knowledge mobilization? And it was, um, um, I'm going to make up the number. It was, I don't know, $20,000. It's okay. So how much is your, um, how much of your grading score is knowledge mobilization? I said knowledge mobilization counts for, I think it was 15% um, of, um, of their application evaluation. Uh -huh. They were applying for multi-millions of dollars and said, well, if it counts as 15%, why don't you budget 15%, right? And it was really this moment, right? <laughs> it's like, oh my, right, right. You are hoping that for $20,000, you're going to be able to hire a student, give them a camera, and they will suddenly become a filmmaker. It's not going to happen. Yeah. What you can do if you budget 15% of your grant towards knowledge mobilization, you can actually hire a filmmaker who will let a student shadow and tag along and help as an assistant so that that student learns valuable skills they would never be able to learn in a classroom while you actually get the production values and the expertise you need to create a fabulous knowledge mobilization product, right? So we have a way to go, but sometimes you can just point out that, you know, they should look at those numbers and maybe think about how are those budgets distributed? Yeah, thanks. I'll just ask you no. a quick part B. Part B. Sure. Um, uh, like I'm thinking mainly of Shirk, they have a KMB toolkit that the, I hope, I, I definitely point researchers to it, um, and that does emphasize audience and purpose. But does the Harris Center and particularly your team have uh, resources on your site for creating um, a valuable, impactful knowledge mobilization plan in any project? Uh, we have some resources. They're not necessarily on our website. Um, we also share a whole bunch of resources with Research Impact Canada Network, which is a network of 20 plus universities across the country who have somebody like me on staff. So we share a whole bunch of resources together as a group of universities. And uh, I'm always happy. Researchers who are looking for interesting resources to help them plan their knowledge mobilization process, I can. I, we have a whole bunch of stuff that they could um, take advantage of. Thank you.
Uh, all right, I don't see any other questions here. I'll give everybody another few seconds to send them in if they have one. Boyan, did you have any uh, final thoughts you wanted to end off on? I think I have spent all my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Uh, well, we want to thank everyone for joining today. Uh, and thank you, of course, uh, to you, Boyan. And thanks to the team at the Harris Center for pulling the session together. Thanks to our sponsor, the Future Skills Center. Uh, and thanks again to everyone who, uh, who made it out today um, virtually uh, to join us. So we will have this event up online um, very soon, probably this afternoon. It'll be on our YouTube channel and our website, which is mun.ca slash Harris Center. So you can share it um, widely with anyone you think that might be interested. Thanks again and stay safe, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. See you, folks.